Hello, everybody. Welcome to a special bonus episode of the Managing Violence podcast. If you've been following our social media, you know the show is due to return on October 11 uh, with a special interview with Spencer Corson. But today is not that day, and we are back a little bit early uh, doing this to, uh, because the opportunity presented to have an informal chat with former guests Randy King and Rory Miller uh, as they are on a seminar tour around the United States. So when I have a chance to talk to those two guys, why would I not record it? And uh, this is a special bonus episode, a little bit less structured, a little bit less formal, more just a couple of guys sitting around talking about martial arts and talking about violence prevention. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. We will be back officially and properly on October 11 with a brand new feel for the Managing Violence podcast. I hope you enjoy the conversation and I look forward to bringing you the next full episode on October 11. Oh, all that fun stuff about the bed not being made and things was not Correct. recorded. Correct. That was a recording. Yeah. We'll, have to, we'll, we'll work that in later. <laughs> Just for the record, both of those two were blushing and I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm joined here on the Managing Violence podcast for a special bonus episode uh, with not only not one guest, but so two good. guests, both former guests, Randy King and Rory Miller, joining us so good, good. Uh, from the same hotel room, which does raise some interesting questions. Uh, mm -hmm. We ha we have had a chat offline. We've noticed that yes, Rory has made the bed before <laughs> before the uh, the conversation has started. Yep. But gentlemen, or uh, was that bed not used? Oh, was that bed not used? It's always a question. Yeah. It's always a yeah, question. No. Uh, gentlemen, uh, thanks for thanks for jumping on and uh, and doing a bit of a fun episode. This is going to be a bonus episode, so probably a little bit less structured than normal. Uh, we, we're basically just going to shoot the shit and see what happens. But uh, yeah. why are you guys together? What's going on? Uh. I was in the UK with a guy named Dave, Dave Woodnow. Fun. We, we were um, drinking as usual after, after the seminar, having some very nice whiskey. And he mentioned he hadn't been to the US and we started bullshitting about how much fun it would be to do a circuit because uh, I haven't seen all of it either of the US and, um, and maybe set up some seminars to pay for it along the way. And the, we, we made the plan. We were going to go and the COVID hit. And he can't he, travel was shut down, but still a good idea. And I was going, I, I think I'll do it myself. And Randy said, I'll go. Yeah, I found out and I'm like, I'm I'm coming. Let's yeah. do this thing. Yeah. So <laughs> it's neither of us are the or we rather we're both the kind of people that if you get a chance to do something, you, you jump in. Yeah. Because that's why would you not? Exactly. So that that was the beginning of the Rand Rory tour, uh, where we decided yeah. to book a bunch of dates and go pretty much where we're filming the worst buddy comedy movie. Yeah. <laughs> and and he, he loves doing all the parts I hate. So he's done the scheduling and coordinating with the hosts and basically the talking to people part. <laughs> um, so I get I get just sit back and be a hermit and drive all day and all night. Yeah. So, so it's been pretty cool so far. Yeah. That's awesome, uh, Randy. Uh, sorry, uh, Rory. Do you, do you want to go? Sorry, I, I'm getting you guys confused. You see, you see, right next to you wearing the same shirt. I don't know who I'm talking to anymore. Uh, I'm so, I'm so glad you've yeah. got hair, uh, Randy. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just, I'll just, I'll just blur in. Um, yeah. you, should, you should come with me to the UK. I've got a UK tour coming up. They're kind of the same thing. Road trip throughout the UK. And on uh, my way, I'll be there. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> as, long, as long as you don't want to get paid, I'm more than happy for you to come along and do all the logistics. So that, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, you guys are you've just started this tour. So where where have you been already? Go, yeah, go sure. So this is week two. So we started in Woodenville, Washington, on the west coast. If you're not from the U.S., uh, then we went down to Salem, Oregon, the state below Washington. We did a little stop there with Sheena Williams. So sorry, we had Brent Yamamoto was our first host. Uh, we did the full two days there plus a bonus half day. And that's kind of how the seminar is going is we do um, an evening class on the Friday and then we do the Saturday, Sunday full seminar. And then we have guest stops on the way. So our first full seminar was Brent Yamamoto in Woodenville and his school was Northwest Martial Arts. And then from there, we went to Salem, from uh, Oregon, not Massachusetts. And we worked with Sheena Williams at Krav Maga Salem. And we did a guest stop there, two hours. Yeah. And then we death marched from there to where we are right now, which is Rifle, Colorado. And we did a, a 2.5 day here with Gabe Cohen, former guest of yours. Yeah. Um, so we got to meet Gabe, which was, he's yeah. 
way better in person than he is on the podcast for sure. He's a great dude. And I highly recommend checking him out. We got copies of his book, which was really neat. Mm-hmm. And that's where we've been so far. Awesome. So where, where's the, where else are you going to? Where's the, uh, what's the rest of the itinerary look like before we actually start talking about other stuff? We're going to stop and see some friends uh, in, in Castle Rock. We're going to see Mark McKeown in Lubbock. We're going to see Terry Trahan and probably Clint. Yeah. Um, from there, we're heading to Ethel, Louisiana, north of Baton Rouge. Yeah. Uh, no, no one's ever heard of the town. It's a tiny town, but Rolf has created a complex called Shooter's Paradise. So we're going to do the basic ambushes and thugs into a violence for a group of primarily shooters. Yep. With threat a lot assessment. Of, yeah. Without a lot of martial arts background, Randy's the bonus day for that is going to be Randy's threat assessment, which is a really good program. Thank you. Um, from there, we're going up to Team Fort Martial Arts in Wilmington, Ohio. With and the Kennedys. The Kennedy family who are just, a, they're a joy to work with. They're really, really superior martial artists. Dad has worked as a prison psychologist, so he has all of that background. And he's got to be an extraordinary person if he can produce two kids that extraordinary. Right. Um, and shout out to Ben Kennedy. He's the one I mentioned to you, Joe, offline, who has almost a million followers on TikTok on his YouTube, on his uh, self-defense martial arts channel. So he's big with the kids on the TikTok. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to try to talk to him about those kind of things. Yeah. And clearly, from clearly, there, uh, clearly Rory is the one that found him on TikTok. No, <laughs> no, it's, it's, uh, let's see. Rory loves TikTok. Pro tip. I'm just kidding. It's not true. Um, I can't remember. Someone else brought me out to Ohio and the Kennedy family, father, son, and daughter showed up. And they, they were just the stars of the show. Just these super fun martial artists who were into everything. And then they invited me back to their, to their dojo, their studio. And, and we've had a, a really solid friendship for a long time now. So um, Wilmington, Ohio, from there, it's up a long-ass drive to Boston, to technically Natick, Massachusetts. It's a lot of long-ass drives. Yep. 2.5 days there. Then we're back to a guest stop in, Ber- no, Indiana. Indiana. Yeah, uh, Brandon, with Brandon Sieg. Yes, with Brandon Sieg. Mansville, Indiana, with Brandon Sieg. That's Gentry Martial Arts. We're heading there. Yeah. Uh, Team Torque, uh, Metro West. Jiu-jitsu. Metro Jiu-Jitsu is in Natick, and then we're doing Gentry Martial Arts as a uh, guest stop, and then we're off to Violet Violence Dynamics, our yearly stop. So yeah. I'm, if you're listening to this on audio, I'm awkwardly circling the logo on Rory's shirt, and it's yeah. not helping our one bed yeah. argument yeah. right and, now. And, and that's really, really, really <laughs> um, so we're doing, not the other one, strangely. <laughs> so we're doing Biodyne Prime with Casey Kekheis and Tammy Yard McCrack and myself and Rory, the thing we do every yeah. year, the biggest, coolest event that we do. Yeah. Terry can't make it this year. Terry can't make it this year, unfortunately. We have something planned for the last day that we can't talk about yet. But it's so But cool. it's, it's one of those, I can't believe they're letting us do this. I don't think they have any idea the, the <laughs> little beehive that they have opened. Yeah. This is <laughs> It's going to be some fantastic, fantastic things that people will be telling their grandchildren about. Yeah, it's going to be my Thanksgiving yeah. story for a very long time. Yes. Wow. Uh, then we're going, and we'll tell you off the show, of course, Joe, because yeah. you're a cool guy, but we can't say it on the show. Yeah. Um, and then we're going, we're staying in Minnesota. We're going to White Tiger Martial Arts with uh, Robert Frankovich. He's hosting us. And then from there, we're hoping for a guest spot somewhere in the middle. Yeah, because it's a long because drive. it's a long drive to Idaho, where we're teaching in Moscow, Idaho, uh, for the last seminar, and that'll be October twenty uh, 30th, thirty first. So two wow. months on the road total. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh, that sounds like such an awesome idea, and uh, man, I hope you guys like each other at the end. Maybe maybe we should do it. Maybe we should revisit it in October and see how you guys are going. <laughs> so far, that's not a bad idea. That's a, yeah, we might hate each other. I don't know. I don't think I don't think that'll happen. But it's, you know, um, separate separate hotel rooms in the, in the end of October. Sometimes well, we do. It's just it, the host. It depends on how much money the host has. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, this one was lucky to get. We're lucky yeah. we got this one. So it's a busy yeah. place. Yeah. Uh, that, it's that, hunting season in Colorado. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, that's, that's really cool guys i'm uh, i'm i'm really jealous not only from a, a teaching point of view but also from an attendee point of view it'd be, be very cool to uh to tag along and do a bunch of those um i was uh, i was fortunate when uh i think we brought over rich dimitri in maybe 2011 and uh i spent basically like two and a half weeks just tr- touring around the country with rich and uh that was right. super cool even though it's the same material over and over it's still really cool just to 
different rooms, different vibes, different different stories come up, that kind of stuff. It's, it'd be super cool. Hey, uh, what, what are you guys actually teaching? Yes. Uh, so the, the opposite of what you just said, we're not doing the same material every time. So what happened, how we set this tour up, if anybody's listening on how to set up a tour, it's a lot of work, but it can be done. Um, we, I, I don't think so. I, just, I have people for that. Yeah, you have people. I'm your people for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, mean, I need me so, some people. So yeah. we, uh, we created a seminar menu. So we had the, the flagship seminar, which is the Dirty Dirty Weekend, which is Dirty Boxing and Dirty Judo. Uh, and that's the original thing we wanted to teach. Yeah. So this is a martial arts seminar tour, not a self-defense seminar tour. Does that make sense? So we're like, we're just fighting people on this one. We're not doing as much self-defense. We're doing stuff. the stuff we do for fun instead of the stuff that's serious. This is stuff that's kept, I'm, I'm older than you, this stuff's kept me addicted to martial arts for 40 years. Right. So if the host wanted, and with the bonus day, they get the self-defense content, right? So the two most popular sellers have been threat assessment on the Friday and then the dirty, dirty weekend. But every location has a different kind of structure for that. So uh, like Brent, he went threat assessment, dirty, dirty. That was our first run at it. Mm -hmm. Then Sheena, we did two hours. We did one hour of leverage and one hour of joint locks. Mm -hmm. Then we went to, so this one, we did uh, conflict communications on the Friday. And then we did the dirty, dirty weekend, even though that wasn't the plan. But, but, the but plan. it was really different because uh, the students had more specific things that they wanted. Yeah. So everything still falls under that umbrella, but it was stuff that we we thought that we'd leave out in most of the seminars. Yeah. Yeah. So we did some groundwork here and stuff that's not in the like dirty, dirty plan. Uh, and then when we're going to Rope's place, we're actually doing Rory's ambushes and thugs with my uh, threat assessment. So I'll be assisting on that one. And then Wilmington, we're doing threat assessment and then some dirty and then some people watching and other stuff. So each host got to pick from the menu of what they want to do. They can kind of build their own, like create their own adventure, right? But the most, the things we're mostly teaching is effectively the dirty boxing, dirty judo kind of infighting hybrid between my stuff and Rory stuff, which is working together shockingly well. Yes. Like it's real cool. Um, and then the threat assessment seems to be the most, those are the biggest ones. So yeah. Nice, nice. So but would I be correct to assume that both the, I mean, obviously dirty judo is going to be going to be extreme close quarters because otherwise judo doesn't really work. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but the dirty boxing would be the same thing, be it their, their close quarter stuff. And uh, yeah. Yeah. So most of it we're doing in what we're defining is, so we're trying to create our own lexicon right now and trying to like really clear up terms. And cause we speak, we have different lineages and stuff. And yeah. so when we say infighting, we mean closer than clinch range, right? Mm -hmm. So chest to chest, chest to side, chest to back. And then the dirty boxing is kind of a little bit out of that clinch range to get to that infighting range. So that's yeah. where most of the material is, but then we add, you know, all the principal stuff because Roy's a principal based yeah. instructor. I'm kind of that way too. So we're going to like leverage and manipulations and adding gravity and all the things that we layer in normally. Uh, very cool. Very cool. It so sounds right, right up my alley. I love, I love that range mostly because I'm, you, uh, you would love it. You would love it. For sure. <laughs> and you would be a beast at that range. Yeah. Oh, you'd be yeah. terrifying. Yeah. You would be a lot of work. <laughs> I, 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 I only prefer that range because, uh, because I'm short sighted and my depth perception is really bad. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, you, you can shut your eyes and fight there just as well. It's, yeah. it's, it's exactly, it's, I think there's yeah. like, I didn't realize this when I was a kid growing up doing martial arts. I just knew that I got hit in the face a lot. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I, I wasn't very good at uh, at defense. I was, uh, I was I could hit fairly hard if people stayed still long enough. But uh, once I could get my hands on them, then I was then I was all right. So that's uh, it's right up my alley. Uh, hey, uh, Rory, what's your, what's your threat assessment material? What does that workshop look like? Oh, sorry, um, sorry, 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 Randy. Randy. <laughs> so I've done it again. It's Randy, happening. I know it's your threat assessment. <laughs> exactly. We're, we're hard to tell apart. We're we're yeah, we're, gonna, we're effectively twins. I get I'm, it. Yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna call you guys Rand Rory together so that I, I don't yes. get it wrong. Yeah. Just so Rand, Rand Rory. Rand what does the threat assessment look like? <laughs> so my my threat assessment uh, thing is kind of a different take on your regular presentation PowerPoint thing. So it goes over the way I've broken down threat assessment is teaching people uh, what to look for and then acting out the things that they're looking for. So we go over what threat assessment is, basic situational awareness, and then we go over, I have something called the quick read. And there's six different categories in the quick read. They are built with the most important things to look at first, and then if you have time, scale down. So it's hands, eyes, um, 
Then we go to proxemics where they're standing. Then we go to adrenaline cues you can see. Then we go to onlookers, verbals, and special knowledge. So we go down this ladder and we I break it up into two categories. So category one, if it's social violence, what threat uh, indicators are presented? And then if it's predatory, asocial, or experienced fighter, because those look exactly the same, because as we train, we get more efficient and the asocial violence is more efficient. Then we can look at those. And so we're teaching them to look for the type of violence in the way the person approaches, as well as what to look for if violence is going to happen. And so we look at like what the hands are going to do, if there's a weapon, what's happening, uh, where the eyes are looking. And then each one of those models has a hat, which we get them to play out. So for example, eyes, right? Very common tactic. So we'll share it, right? So eyes kind of indicate where the intent is going. If the eyes are like deadlocked on, it's probably social violence. If they're not making eye contact, usually it's antisocial, asocial violence. Uh, and then the hack for it. So we get people to act that out, right? They practice making that weird eye contact. They practice, you know, looking for cameras. They practice with witness checks. So the people can actually see it because you can't, you can't talk your way through a skill. You've got to actually do the skill. So the PowerPoint isn't enough for threat assessment, in my opinion. So we actually get them playing with it. And then the hack for that would be, okay, so when the bad guy takes her eyes off you, you move position, right? So then when the person turns around, if they're going for a sucker punch or whatever, we've changed. So we break that down with all of them. We start off with a video assessment. And then at the end, we do the same video to see, you know, what they pick up. And it's, it's, it went really well. And they got a lot out of it in this first one, at least. Yeah. Ah, that's awesome. That sounds like a sounds like a really cool, uh, really cool workshop to do. I also like, I mean, uh, we talk about threat assessment at all sorts of different levels, but but uh, I really enjoy the putting in practical drills to sort of right. illustrate points because uh, it, it's something that I, I found like I've done so many of those PowerPoint presentations around you know pre pre incident indicators and all all that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, and and sometimes your your time is such and the app the appetite of the client base is such that you don't get past the PowerPoint, but uh, right it is uh it is super cool to be able to in introduce some some real practical practice uh of, of how to do this stuff beyond just trying to get awkward role plays happening which which never seem to work when people suck at <laughs> role plays right exactly yeah actually it's a it's an interesting lead into something that's kind of topical here at the moment uh and i know that the us is a, is a little bit ahead of us in, in this space uh, so I guess by, by way of context, Australia, the two major cities, two biggest cities, I always say the two major cities, or else everyone in Australia will be upset. Uh, but the, <laughs> the two biggest cities in Australia, Sydney and Melbourne, have been locked down for quite a while. Uh, here, here where I am in Melbourne, we're coming up on 230 days of lockdown or something, like complete curfew, five five reasons to leave the house, like like pretty pretty hard, hardcore sort of but restrictions. Unfortunately, COVID has completely disappeared. Uh, no, no. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Exactly, it's yeah. working. So, yeah, we've got police being attacked now. Like it's it's getting pretty. Yeah, I saw pe that. Pe people's uh, people's tolerance is pretty much at an end. Uh, so mm -hmm. anyway, but the, the good the good news is that it won't be much longer. We're told, but uh, the the bad news is the government's now putting in some. Uh, they've made some statements along the lines of businesses will have to re will it won't be law that uh, you cannot attend a certain service if you uh, are not vaccinated. However, businesses will be fined if they have unvaccinated people on site. So, uh. so, so uh, it's, it's going to put business owners in a really interesting situation where they're going to have to be vaccine police. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, both, of, both of you have worked with all sorts of different enterprises. You know that mm -hmm. the people that are going to be standing on the front door uh, enforcing vaccination for entry into a business or, a, or mm -hmm. an event, or even a wedding, or a funeral, where that we're already emotionally charged situations. Those people are probably going to be eighteen years old. <laughs> they're they're yeah, probably exactly. going to be early twenties. They're going to be minimum wage. They might be security guards, which doesn't mean they're any better prepared than anyone else. Uh, what sort of what sort of things would you be looking at if you if you're brought in by a client to say, hey, we need to give our people some skills because we know they're going to deal with some conflict. They're going to deal with some aggression. There's a, there's a chance they will be assaulted because this is going to happen outside pubs and clubs and, and hospitality mm -hmm. venues as well, where people are already intoxicated and pre-drinking and then being told, no, you can't come in because you can't prove your vaccination status. What sort of stuff would you guys be teaching? Let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to throw you under the bus there. What sort of stuff do you think sure. they need to know? So I'm going to kick this mostly Randy because he has more bouncing experience. And this is just basic bouncing. Yeah. Just with, just with asking for ID with a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, but 
Canada, right? U.S. law. The thing that's freaking me out about this is that we have a number of statutes and a number of federal laws and a lot of case studying that say it's flat out illegal to ask about medical information because it is private. Mm. The, the mandate that they're putting now violates rules that they've been writing for 20 years. And that, that dichotomy, I would sit there, there's no legal way to be on either side of this situation. Right. Um, so I, I would just, I would, that's not a contract I would take. Yeah. But the mechanics of it, are the same as asking for ID. I think so. Canada's already in vaccine passport stage. So I luckily, I got out before restrictions got more draconian yeah. again. I literally like just landed and three days later, they're like, oh, we're on vaccine passports, um, which is ridiculous. Like uh, it's just forcing anybody to do anything is just never a bad, uh, never a good idea. But um, I think we would definitely, we would have to go more to like a, um, a de-escalation model. And I would definitely be really advocating the upper management close. So this is an old sales tactic, but upper management close is, hey, look, it's not me, it's my boss, right? Like the boss is the one. So you'd be like, look, I think it's dumb too, or whatever, or whatever your view is. But you know, this is my job. You got a job too. I, I would love to let you in, but then I'm going to get fired. That would be one of the like, backing points I would go to but I also think too right like you get way more pre you, you're going to know who the people are that are a problem because you're getting people that are walking towards the bar without a mask there's going to be a lot of indications of the people being an issue right mm -hmm. or you're going to see them apping themselves up or they're going to be talking loud like I wonder if this place is going to have like th it's going to be very public which people are probably going to be the problem. It's not going to be like sneaky ninja, non-vaccinated, like Naruto running into your building, right? It's 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 going to be pretty vocal. So it's going to be the standard, yeah, the ID de-escalation thing, right? That's that's where it's going to go. But definitely for me, if I was having to run it, I would definitely be blaming the boss, right? Look, it's the government, man. Like it's I'm making six fifty an hour, bro. You think I want to throw you out? No, but it's my job. Yeah, I think that's a. Uh... The, the early the early commentary from the government has been oh business owners can just say it's out they're just following the law it's like yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, I've tried that a lot people still punch right. people <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so it's, don't shoot the it's messenger. gonna make things yeah. rough like yeah. there's there's no there's no good answer because some people are going to be some people wear their non-vaccination as a badge of honor it's yep. their freedom so mm -hmm. they're gonna walk in looking for a fight and you're just gonna get those it's yeah. just it's gonna happen they're going to go there knowing they're not allowed and they're going to pick a fight. There should, it's just going to happen. No, you're, you're absolutely right. It's uh, that's going to create some more work, I guess. Uh, yeah, which, exactly. <laughs> good know. time. Good time to be running a security company, but not mm. doing the ground level security. Yeah. <laughs> it's also, um, one, one thing to look at that goes is you also need to manage the reputation of the organization. Yeah. Mm. So it's one of those, it's incredibly important for the staff to be consistent. Yes. So that you get the reputation for they're, they're serious when they say they check. Yeah. And it'll cut out down a lot of the people that are looking for the fight. Right. Because the people with the wavery, more wavery boundaries will so be weaker. Those yeah. are the ones that'll get more, more bad attention. Yeah. yeah. I, actually, it's a really good point, Rory, because uh, I, I remember my, from my bouncing days that they, right around the time I started, they brought in a curfew or like a, a lockout, like after 3 a.m., pubs weren't right. allowed to let anyone else in, right? It was mm -hmm. this idea. It was, it was local government level, but it was basically this idea that uh, if you let people in after that time, nothing good happens. It's like, well, you know, they just fight outside instead of inside, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But there was, a, there was a standard law that everyone in the city knew that you can't come in after 3, 3 a.m. However, the places that would make exceptions uh <laughs> they, they got absolutely smashed because it didn't take long for word to spread that you know uh certain places will draw some gray lines around certain things depending right. on what gender you are and what you're offering and like there's it becomes this whole sort of underground market of yeah <laughs> illegality yeah. but uh yeah <laughs> but you're right i like it Venue is going to have to look after their own reputation. Obviously, the, the penalties the penalties that have been talked about for failing to comply with this are substantial from a business point of view. So, uh, and and of course, no one wants to be shut down again. Right. So I, I think there there is that piece, but uh, but yeah, it's not going to help that person on the front line necessarily uh, dealing with that. Especially the first wave. I think maybe the, after the first month, things will calm down a little bit because right. people will yeah. kind of figure out where they stand and. There may be some relaxation in different protocols and so on, but we'll we'll see how that plays out. But uh, well, and 
I think there's there's going to be a rise in like that kind of social common street violence. We saw it in Edmonton um, because people have been locked down for how many? 258 days or whatever you oh, said, right? Yeah. Like uh, social skills are down. Anger is up. Right. So even like going to Walmart's more aggressive now. Right. Or whatever giant super place you have with grocery shopping. Right. Yeah. Like people are banging cars, way more road rage. It just seems like people are more agitated because they've been locked up. Another, you know, you lock people up in a room long enough, and you let them free with inconsistent things. They're going to be pissy and they're going to take it on other people. Well, and those of us that know we need it. Joe, how long has it been since you've been punched in the face? About five years, I think. No, I'm not, I'm not talking. You trained to get punched in the face. That's all right. Again, it's, it's, it's been a minute since we've been able to do contact training, but yeah. It, you, right, you, right, that's what I mean. I, and so for those of us that were controlling ourselves anyway with contact, yeah, taking that away puts us on edge. Yeah. It's, I, I need to get punched in the mouth about once a month just to keep myself level. <laughs> um, this is why you do, this why you do uh, tandem seminars now. Well, literally, we've been talking about this. This seminar was the light at the end of the tunnel for both of us. Like, yeah. legitimately, like, not to make the show too heavy, but I was in a bad yeah. spot. Like, you put and lock my extroverted ass in a room and say, I can't do what I love. And it's really tough, right? I can only do so much online stuff. And Rory, Rory's already I, not a social I, person. I, I like the solitude, um, but I was hating the routine. Yeah. Doing this. I am not built to do the same thing every morning. Um. I, I suck at maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this for us was like, even pretty much, this is a road trip. Like Roy said, with the seminars paying for it, we needed to get in the road. We needed to bro down. We needed to hang out and do yeah. fun stuff and have, you know, have the conversations we used to have and like make our life feel normal again. So for me, this, I already feel much better. Uh, I was in a really bad spot and I'm feeling way better just being on the road and teaching again. Mm. Yeah. Um, Super, super jealous. <laughs> for, for, for anyone for anyone who's listening from the UK, March, April next year, if you're interested in hosting me, hit me up. Uh, we, we'll get everything pencil, penciled in now, but uh, confirmed once borders are officially open. Because at the moment, Australians awesome. aren't even allowed to leave the country, let alone get back in. So Right. <laughs> so, uh, well, congrats on the tour, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks, man. It's, uh, it should be, should be pretty exciting. We've got some former guests that are hosting some stuff. Um, Everything from verbal de-escalation, threat assessment to combat sumo, which is going to be kind of kind of fun. Oh, but, uh, oh that'll be a good one. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Shout out to Tommy Joe Moore for that idea. He's like, I want I want to do the sumo session, but the combative application of it, I'm like, oh, that's juicy. I like this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be a bit of fun. But um, that's uh, that's our plan as well. We're doing the Rad Rory. We're already getting the Europe people. Like, when are you coming here? So we're hoping fall. So we'll. We're not overlapping. You can come to both of us. Go to Joe's <laughs> thing, then come to ours. Of course, uh, if we did overlap for two days, that would be super fun. Yeah, yeah just like a oh, super absolutely. seminar. That'd be fun. Super seminar and a pub. I would pub. I want to say the pub. Let's, let's make it a weekend. Yes. Make it a, make exactly. it a long weekend or something. Let's, yeah, that'd, <laughs> yeah. Be, that'd be absolutely brilliant. Uh, so, uh, yeah, also curious for, from from your perspective, guys. Like, what are you finding? Like, with, with students, I mean, I, I know different areas of the U.S. are different different restrictions and different levels of contact and all that kind of stuff. Uh, talking to a a good friend of mine uh, who who runs a martial arts club, he said that with it, it's really noticeable with the kids. Like his, his the five year old students are now acting like three year olds. The, the like the ten year olds are acting more like five year olds. The teenagers are acting like they're ten or twelve. Like there's a massive social regression um, just mm. from kids that have been mm. like locked up and not able to socialize and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I know you guys are teaching adults, but are you finding like what, what's sort of the vibe on the ground? Are people super excited to be there, or how's it going? Uh, the people that are there are super excited to be there. The, the numbers were lower than everyone expected. Yeah. Um, and it's like the, the place we were in, I, I'm going to leave these out. There's one place we, we were in, which is Karen Central. I don't know if you're using that term, Karen. term yet. Yeah, we, we have Karens. Okay. okay. So, so is, is Karen Central. Literally, it's, it's one of the cities and one of the, in the Pacific Northwest where, you know, people are actually afraid and, so the people that show up are the ones that aren't. Um, this one, I loved this one because this one was interesting. Only one of the people that showed up wasn't an ex-con. <laughs> because I don't know if you know, but Gabe Cohen runs yeah. a recovery cafe yeah. now, right? So and Gabe was hosting. So it was one per everyone else was ex-cons. It was I was the <laughs> choir boy, and I'm not used to being the choir yeah, boy. It was, <laughs> and, and these were like, yeah, these were like 
the guys that I spent most of my time with. I was on the other side of the bars, but like I serious time, really well. serious time, like literally at lunch, one of the guys said, and the second time I was shot in the face, just so casually. I'm <laughs> yeah. like, what? So it was pretty awesome. Um, we had lots of good talks about why you should not do meth. Yes. Meth is a bad drug and <laughs> pro tip, everybody. Yeah. Good news. Um, yeah. I think honestly, if Rory wasn't with me on this tour, I would have took a self-confidence hit because yeah. the numbers have been so low because like we had a, we had a place where a friend of ours came, but because there was no masks being there, they didn't want to train. Right. And that's totally up to them. Uh, especially in that case, that was yeah. a very special case, yeah. really sick in real life. Yeah. But um, it's the numbers are deaf everywhere. Like the places we thought would be shoe and sellouts have been smaller. Uh, but it's this COVID is the is a, just another fucking dividing line between people, right? It's just another way for people to get put in a different box. It's very frustrating. Yeah, that, that's, that's and then insane. we had a little bit more bad luck. Sorry, uh, there was a hurricane in Louisiana. <laughs> So uh, the host there lost almost all the people registered because they had to took the money from the seminar to repair their homes. So that was also an interesting. It's quite, it's quite unreasonable, really. I mean, where's yeah, your priorities? The worst. Yeah. I want to shun all of them. <laughs> it's, priorities are important. Yes. Family is more important. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. But it doesn't matter. You're still having a great. Oh, time. it's still so, so good. Fun. And like we were saying to the host, so because some of the hosts are. I'm going to use the word embarrassed and they shouldn't be right. Cause like, Oh, we expected bigger. Like we're so worried. We don't care. We like, if we could make a living teaching smaller groups, that would be ideal. Mm. Right. Because you get that one-on-one -on -one interaction. Yeah. Like today's seminar yesterday and today's seminar was very client driven. When you have 30, 40 people in a room, you have to do your seminar. But when there's eight to 10, you can really direct it with the client's yeah. need. And that's why we do this. It's yeah. not for us to be like, look at our cool shit. It's what do you need as a client? Right. Mm. let's yeah. let's segue this off of covid because i'm <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so, sorry uh, so the, the seminar, the right seminar tour is canceled uh, think, these guys are drinking for the rest of the time <laughs> yeah i think i want to drink now i wasn't drinking earlier uh, this, <laughs> you guys this, thought is, this, this, is one, this is one of the things you can do you can support yep. local businesses like Absolutely. all the places hosting us on the tour it's an so excellent idea share this podcast tell people because a lot of the gyms that are bringing us in, they're not at the numbers they need to make something off of this, right? And part of this tour is trying to help and connect cool people and all that stuff. Yeah. So jump on the Rand Rory Facebook group, support the businesses that are supporting us. When Joe goes on tour, help them share it. If you're near it, tell everybody. Let's get stuff back to normal. Absolutely. Yeah, could, couldn't agree more. Let's talk about some of the fun stuff you guys are doing. So uh <laughs> yeah, so two, two and a half days of training that's a that's a it's a pretty good whack for uh for people that haven't been training for a while uh, how are you guys holding up to doing the teaching whack for me yeah, yeah like like the first day after, how are you guys teaching after two days of like standing and talking like i woke up on monday the first week i'm like oh my back i i'm not <laughs> i'm at a seminar shape this is yeah. not okay the other cool thing about it it's long but like the road trip stuff's been cool too. We're getting to see a lot of Americana. We're getting to do a lot of cool yeah. stuff, but yeah, two days, two days of training is a lot. And a lot of people haven't done it. Right. And yeah, uh, but they, they've been, they've been sticking in there. Yes. They've been excited. Yes. Um, we're, we try to be really careful if their, their brains are starting to get full, then let them have a break. Yeah. We let, shut her down. Yeah. Let, let's have a briefing. Let's, let's talk about what we just did. What do you want to do next? Yeah. Um, that's another you know, within the, within the teaching philosophy is we're there to serve the students, not for them to, mm. to kiss up to us. Yeah. And part of that is making sure that they, they have time to tell us what they want. Yeah. So mm. we can. And I think it. one of the other biggest things is this isn't like our regular, like, but both me and Rory seminars are very similar and there's, they're about at least minor, like 50 education, sitting and talk 50% physical movement. Yeah. That is not this. The yeah. Friday is sitting down, but Saturday, Sunday, we are moving constantly. We're yeah. pummeling, we're infighting, we're hitting, we're like striking, we're joint locking, we're doing takedowns. It's it's a it's a martial arts seminar, right? So that's why it's been really fun. Like, yeah. We're always, we can't, and we've tried, we can't not pepper in the self-defense. We have to. Yeah. We have to mention some legal stuff. So you're always going to get that with us, but this is entirely physical skills. And the job is in nowhere in this are we telling people to escape, right? We're like, and this is how you just F this dude up, right? That's kind of the cool part about it. 
yeah it, it, it is fun to sort of uh take, take the handbrakes off occasionally and just go you know what let's, let's, let's just talk about a worst case scenario let's just have some fun with this rather than exactly worrying yeah. about the secondary and tertiary consequences of decisions and blah 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 right it's, <laughs> yeah. sometimes it's just fun to put some rounds down range right um, exactly yeah uh a question for you guys, I guess probably in, a, in a more of an instructor niche question, because this is something that I've always kind of been on the, I don't know if I've been on the fence about, but I've kind of tried to find the right balance with in my, whenever I'm teaching seminars. We've, I know both you guys have probably attended a lot of different training over the years. You both delivered a lot of different training. I find that there are some seminars that you go to where you learn 32 new tricks that were all awesome, but you don't have any time to really rep them or drill them. Uh, so you might remember one or two things that that kind of stirred an idea in your head and you may try to practice it the next time you get back to class, but otherwise it was just kind of a fun entertainment experience. And, and, and often I find this with high profile martial artists, like you get a UFC fighter come in, you get someone who's like, like it's more about the photo op with a little bit of sweating. um, And and they just want to dump a bunch of techniques on you. And that's cool. And then you got other seminars where like you want, you might hear like two or three concepts over a day and you've done a thousand reps on them. And at the end of it, you're like, I'm not even sure if I had fun because that was just a lot of hard work, <laughs> but you're actually better for it. <laughs> and, and I can't decide which model I prefer as a participant because sometimes you just want the cool idea. I not really, I'm not, not really going to the seminar because I want to work hard. But then on the other end, like when you come out of a seminar, you're like, I, th- I think I'm actually better at this because of that one experience. Like, where do you guys find that balance? How do you structure your seminars? We don't do either of those. We okay. kind of do the middle. No, we don't. We don't well, the, do the, okay, middle. The, we I guess the, the everyone sort of fits somewhere in the middle. But how, how do you guys? Yeah, find what the what we do is completely different. Okay, it's because getting things is in the middle. So, um, what we do here is we play a game, and and mm-hmm. we've got two games that we play. Yeah. Um. So, uh, Randy likes pummeling because it works good at his range. I like what I call infighting flow because it works good at my range. So. They play with the game and then we take them out and do what we skill build, which might be, it's, it's never a technique, but might be a class of techniques. So this, this is how to use the elbow as a leverage point. And you can use it for unbalancing and getting past people and getting to the golden spot, you know, on the, on the rear flank. And they play with it. And then we play games with the elbow, just as an example. And then we throw them back into the big game. And now they aren't obsessing on the elbow, but now it's suddenly apparent to them everywhere. So they just learned to see it and now they play with it. And now it's a part of them. They can never not see that again. Mm-hmm. And then we take them out and build them next and it, it, this continuous flow. So they come out of it with one game in particular um, with a whole bunch of new ways to see, but the game is really good at integrating the new stuff in. So if there's one weakness to what we do, it can be hard to articulate afterwards. Yeah. So you get people that can improvise locks under pressure, but they don't know the name of the single lock. Mm. And, and so it's that model has worked really well uh, for me yeah. and, and yeah. for Randy since he started using it. And sometimes you'll get someone who actually abandons themselves to the game who's playing. And in, in two days, you cannot tell them from someone who's been training for 20 years. Yeah. That's it, really cool. It, it, it works that fast. Um, so, cause I, I've had the seminars where I don't remember anything. Yeah. And I've had the seminars where it was only three things drilled ever, but the ones that really resonated was where I got an idea that explained nine things I already had. Yeah. And, and if you can take nine things and turn to one thing in your head, you can fight with it 10 times better. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's what we're trying to do. So yeah. Play-based models, what Rory calls it. And it's, yeah, it's game skill build kind of drill back to the game yeah and they keep going and going and going and that seemed like we were playing so we i do two types of basic pummels like a head pummel and a out of body pummel right so like a fight for underhooks type of position mm-hmm. uh and honestly like that within an hour they looked like they had at least wrestled a little bit before in their life right they were doing duck unders and arm drags and carries and it looked really really cool but before they couldn't even move their hands and feet so like Rory always says, humans learn best through play. And that's been exacerbated at least. It's been shown over and over again here uh, in these yeah. games. So we're getting, they take people from zero and get in there. So it's not a couple of techniques and drilling. It's giving those concepts, getting those principles, and then letting them find their own thing. Like we had a, we had a great question from one of the clients. They're like, do you have a combination you can show us for this, right? Like what's the combo? And they wanted that systemization my joke is combos are caught up for mma right people think because you're never gonna do a freaking combo in real life right or you're never 
but you know, they want these combos. It's just their kata. It's the way they do it. It's their pattern. And so our answer was, we don't want to show you this. We just, we want to teach you how to see where you can throw strikes and then to throw the strikes you see, as opposed to trying to pre-pattern a condition. Yeah. You memorize the combo, but you feel the flow. Yes. And that feeling of flow will come out in a fight. The memorization won't. So in my, uh, in my experience. Yes. Yeah. I f- fully agree. Actually, so, something you just said there, uh, Rory, that, uh, when you explain that that concept about that you once you see it you can't unsee it uh when, when you when you yeah. introduce a, a principle um it reminds me so much like when i start when i switch from when well, i switch but when i started to incorporate brazilian jiu-jitsu and started doing brazilian jiu-jitsu training and after already having a judo background obviously i mean the the, the arts are very very similar to begin with um but the the one thing that um brazilian jiu-jitsu has that judo doesn't have is a whole bunch of names for stuff on the ground Right. Um, like, like we were talking like, about that today. Right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So we, we've got yeah, like we, in, in, you, know, you, you, you name your holds, it. like you name your holds yeah. and you and your chokes and your arm bars. But yeah. like how you got there is like, I don't know. I rolled him over. Right. Um, yeah. But uh, when I start when I started having success in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, when I started, like, especially on the off of my back and I was doing sweeps and things like that, which I never really played with much in judo, because if you're on your back, you pretty much just held on to guard until you stood up. Uh, but um when I, what I started having success with is when I started applying the concepts that I would use to off balance someone standing and then use those same yeah. principles on the ground. Right. So you take right. away a, a, a point of balance, you t- whether it's scooping your hand, whether it's moving your knee, whatever it is, it's going to create a destabilization on that side. And then you basically do a throw, but from your back and it ends up being a sweep. And to this day, like if someone said, write down your favorite sweeps, I actually have no idea what they are. And I don't think about, <laughs> I don't think about when I'm doing them, I'm going to do a wheelbarrow sweep, like to, to, to pick a name. Like I'm just, yeah. he's off balance in that direction and I've got to leave a point over here. So I'm going to push him in that way. So I can't really teach it. It's just, I feel it when it's there, it's there. Yeah. But the thing is with practice, you can teach that. Mm. You can teach people to get that same intuitive feel. Yeah. And that's I couldn't teach that isolated technique because it doesn't look yeah. the same every time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's, and once, but once you, um, I wrote something that they, where I, the words that came out were, I had not yet, I was talking about something a long time ago in training. I had not yet gotten over the idea of technique-based training. Mm. Mm. Uh, I, I needed to outgrow it. Right. And, and, and once you outgrow it, yeah. If, if people want technique, some people want to have someone in a white pajamas tell them what to do. And that, that's another thing I think we have to help almost all students get over. You have to tell yourself what to do. Mm-hmm. You're the boss of you, not me. Yeah. Let's play. Yeah. So, yeah, I know. and so so many parallels. Like I started yeah. off with my first my first grappling sport was wrestling. Wrestling led to judo, judo to Brazilian jiu jitsu. Then there was sumo, and there was traditional Japanese jiu jitsu, and there was belt wrestling, and there was Cornish wrestling, and Scott backhold wrestling, like all sorts of wrestling stuff, right? Over the mm-hmm. years, and sambo was in there as well. But uh, over over a certain amount of time, like it wasn't even about training that particular art. Like the the art just mm-hmm. became the set of rules. It was like the this mm-hmm. the, like the skill. Yeah is wrestling or the skill is moving exerting force on a human body and then the sport or the art just becomes like the the boundaries we're going to set on how to play this particular version of that that game right. and mm-hmm. and so i could go and compete at a pretty decent level in in all these different sports because the concepts of how to move a human body were the same and all it changed was the outcome uh right. what i was trying yeah. to achieve with with that particular output of skills um and to teach that way deliberately. Like I came across that accidentally. No one ever told me, Hey, look for these principles other than, you yeah. know, if you do judo for more than five minutes, you know, you're looking for Kazushi and, 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 and Kake and Sakuri and all that. Like you're looking for the, the elements of a throw, but you're still trying to me- memorize it by rote <laughs> as, mm-hmm. as opposed to actually, yeah. Um, understanding it. But once you do understand it, the applications are immense. It's like yeah. what Masashi was talking about, right? 500 years ago. Yeah. See the way in all things. Yeah. So, so we, we've, we've gone from COVID to Masashi. So this, what, a, yeah. what a great conversation. It's a good podcast. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I haven't got cannibalism yet, so I don't feel like I'm really here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm probably going to edit out some of the depressing COVID talk. So if, you, if you're here at this point, you're like, what COVID talk? I was kind of hoping like, you would. Yeah. Yeah, it got real, like, got real dark. It got, it got real dark for, for a minute yeah, there. And yeah. it's, uh, it's, this, this isn't really achieving the goal of a bonus show. The bonus show is supposed <laughs> to create excitement. And people go, Jesus, I've never listened to this exactly. show again. Exactly. Get people to go to seminars. <laughs> go to <Ooh>. seminars. <laughs> go to seminars. <laughs> What are you guys looking forward to coming up? Like, I mean, uh, is there anything you haven't oh. taught yet? Are you looking forward to teaching? Like, what what is it that's uh, that's kind of exciting moving forward? 
I, I think personally, most of the exciting stuff is the stuff we're going to see, not the stuff we're going to yeah. teach, right? So like, we're going to see friends and our next stop is uh, Louisiana and both uh, Rory's wife and my fiance are flying down to meet us. So that's going to be super cool. And we're going to yeah. ideally bar hop in New Orleans and have a fun time there. And like we did Grand Canyon and Big Dune and the Hoover Dam and all this cool stuff. And that's been the really exciting thing. Yeah. I'm excited to see everybody again, right? Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't make Violence Dynamics last year because I was locked in Canada. So I'd do it remotely. And so I get to go see, you know. That was the best one too. Yeah, it was the best one because I wasn't there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but Kate, Kate, I get to see Casey and I get to see Tammy and, you know, getting to see Rory and, you know, going to see the, the Kennedys and all the people that I've missed for so long, right? So the teaching is cool. I missed it. I love it. I'm glad I get to do it. But it's like, if this is, if that, if this, there's 10 points in this trip. That's like two of the points, right? The rest is like reconnecting and just getting to see everybody. So that's what I'm looking forward to. It, it, all of that. There is one teaching thing I'm looking forward to is, is watching this evolve. Cause it's already evolved. Yes. In two weeks. That's true. And um, cause again, after every class we debrief it, you know, what can we do better? What work? Right. What could we change the order around to make things work better? Yeah. What can we add in? And, um, and Randy and I have a bet. Um, Randy thinks that the middle, the middle ones are going to be the best. Yeah. And then we're going to kind of be phoning in the last one. That's right. Thing. And, um, <laughs> I think good, good, sell, good sales pitch for the, for the October seminars, Randy. Yeah. And I, I think that, <laughs> sorry, Andy and Opal. <laughs> I, I personally think that, that enough of the middle ones are different and we're going to be tight at every time that yeah. I think the last one will be the best. I think so. and from the evolution from number one to number two. I think Rory's right as per usual. Yeah. So, uh, but it's they don't pay me to be wrong. They don't pay to be wrong. But that's the yeah. thing, right? Like, just how much we tightened up and how much we integrated more from Washington to Salem to now is yeah. amazing. And we're only one third through the tour, right? Yeah. Like, or not even. Yeah, two weeks yeah. in, of eight weeks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's so much to be said for getting in the groove. I mean, like yes. during, our, during our big lockdown last year, I, I delivered the same the same webinar four days a week for six no, weeks, sure. right? <laughs> <laughs> to 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 the same organization, just different groups of people, right? Right. Um, like that, and and if you if you've never delivered four or five hours on Zoom, it's 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 draining, right? It's it's it's, it's as draining as ten hours face to face. I think, like, yeah, when agreed. It comes to presenting agreed. material because you get no energy transfer from you. Yes. From so, like, I, I did this over and over and over, and and by the end of that stretch, like, hundred percent, I was mailing it in. Like, it, but yeah. when I looked at the participant feedback, like towards the end was the best feedback because it was you had really so tight. Yeah. Like it yeah. was like every, everything was scripted. <laughs> everything was nailed down. If yeah. I, I had my, my standard, okay, really engaged group. This is the version they get kind of engaged group. This is the version they get like garden gnome group. This is the version they get. <laughs> and, right. and I could try to nail it and without even realizing it, just the sheer act of repetition and going through stuff and improving stuff. Like it, it makes a huge difference. So even when you're not like, even when you're emotionally, you're just kind of shot and you're ready to go home. Um, just the, the fact that you've been, drilling it so tightly it's going to be a quality product well and we've said this lots like they don't know like me and rory have taught not in our best form some mornings uh back <laughs> in the day and uh <laughs> the clients don't know right if you just yeah. do your best and whatever but we know that's the thing right and it, it, that's one of the things sometimes the best for a student is not the most fun for you yeah what, often what, <laughs> what, what one instructor thing that we can bandy around if you want is like whenever you're doing a class you have stories to back up certain points and you've got the best story that shows that point best. Okay, soon see it for the first time. It is the best story. You're telling it for the 30th time. You're fucking sick of it. Yeah. <laughs> you've got a second best story and a third best story and a fourth best story and a fifth best story. And, but that's not what the students need or want. And, the best. and this is why our, this stuff, we call it weirdness creep when we're doing scenarios where, you know, you've done the scenario 50 times. So now you want to add in something else to spice it up because you're bored. Students are bored. They don't know. Mm. And then you add something else. So you get bored with that version. You add something else. And within like 10 generations of this, you, you're trying to figure out how to how to put a fake toy laser on a dog. <laughs> so it, the aliens won't. And right. It, right. And it gets so unrealistic and, and it's hard to keep it tight, real, what they need. It is one of the reasons why uh, 
I like this class better. My basic ambushes and thugs, I've taught so many times I'm sick of it. Um, this is what I do for fun. This is brawling. This will always be fun. Yeah. The principal's class is still fun, but it's exhausting. It's so deep. The ICD is still fun. It's still fresh. Um, but anything you've taught, and I, my heart went out to you when you said you were teaching the same oh. class four hours a day, four days a week. It's like, I just wanted to give you a hug and a little whiskey. <laughs> yeah. And that's that was a cool. lot of drinking. Lot and just to uh, just to decode Rory's three letter acronym, IDC is his instructor development course that he runs with his group. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah it, it, there's some parallels there to when you go like you go to see a band live that you loved as a teenager and they want to play their new stuff and like no, yeah, exactly. I don't care about your new stuff. I hate your new stuff. I want to hear the greatest yeah. hits, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and you, you you raise such a good point there about like for professional instructors, they get bored of the material, right? We're all human beings. We've taught it so many times. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've been guilty of this where I've gone back to a course that I've written that, that I like that has been well received. And then like, I'll, I'll be looking and I'll want to change something. Like I'll be, I'll be manipulating stuff, adding stuff in taking some stuff out. And mm -hmm. I, I had, I had a, uh, a colleague say to me once like, okay, so look, he's looking at version one and like version 3.6, whatever it was. He's like, do you think this version is better? Yeah. <laughs> or is it just newer? <laughs> Right. right. And, and yeah. it incorporated some things. Like there's little tweaks that might have been better along the way. Like you learn something new and you put it in yeah. there and it seems to yeah. fit. But sometimes something new you learned that was cool just doesn't fit that material. Like it, it deserves to be its own standalone course, not shoehorned into something that you already did because it's exciting for you to talk about. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's it, it's something for us to be really mindful of because like when you're uh, like a lot of instructors are going to be listening to this, they're basically sole traders, right? They're, they're solo operators that are only really having their material vetted by themselves. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Even if they even if they have people working for them or working with them, they're probably still running their own programs. Like you have to be aware mm -hmm. of that that bias towards something mm -hmm. new and shiny, yeah. when maybe what you've been teaching for thirty years has been working for thirty years because it's fundamentally yeah. sound. <laughs> right. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. never assume your students know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had an experience where I was teaching a group just recently, and I'm like, so everyone everyone's familiar with the OODA loop, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, Okay. All right. Cool. Let's let's let's, let's talk a little bit about let's, Uda, right? Let's back this up uh, first. Yeah, exactly. like, and even though like you can you can debate the merits of Uda Loop, I just with a group, I assume they'd heard it before. They'd never heard it before. Right. So I went, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's build some foundations. But sometimes we get we we kind of forget, uh, yeah, the 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 privileged information that we take for granted. All right. The, we are not our clients. We are not our clients. Yeah. Yeah. What one? It's. Once you have that that almost curse of knowledge, it's hard to forget what you didn't know before, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Like the things that blew your mind. Like when I first heard Uda, it blew my mind. But now I've heard it so much, you expect that everybody knows it, right? Mm -hmm. And so we, because once you have it, you forget it. You forget you didn't have it. And yeah. so we forget what was important at the beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and even just things like basic coordination, <laughs> the, yeah. the things that you take for granted, right? Like you try to get you try yeah. to get a bunch of regular people to pummel. And you're like, yeah. oh, oh yeah, oh. trust me. Oh. Yeah. That's not a natural skill. How about that? It's like, yeah, it's like, I just assume that people learn how to walk and they learn how to pummel. Apparently they don't. Right? Hey, Randy taught me pummeling a week ago. Yeah. And the hardest thing for me is not cheating. Because it's because <laughs> I I've been trained or it, the world trained me, not an instructor, that any predictable rhythm is death. Right. Mm -hmm. The idea of, of doing a pattern three times freaks me out so <laughs> fighting the instinct to boom boom and no i'm gonna pull back haha i didn't see that coming yeah <laughs> is oh you're, you're it, that it, guy who ruins every drill right and, and that's because that's what the drills are for to be ruined <laughs> it's because if, if a drill is predictable hubbard hubbard i hate with the from the bottom of my soul in order to make it work i have to get control of the weapon and then voluntarily give control back so he gets a turn yeah. fuck that <laughs> that is who but is the fidget spinner of the martial arts <laughs> um i it just oh <laughs> that, that's the quote of the episode uh, yeah who, who is the fidget spinner of the martial arts worst habit possible yeah is yeah so i so pummeling hard for me yeah. to remember i'm doing this for the student yes mm. um cuz it's yeah even if we take away from pummeling, like, like this, your idea of like, okay, move your left hand here, and then like their right mm -hmm. foot moves. You're like, what, what, what went wrong in between, <laughs> like the instruction yeah. and <laughs> the execution? Like so, and, something, something got missed. Right? And and I find that weirder in um, in experienced martial artists mm. because especially once they've learned to break pattern and stuff, um, 
you know, I have, I have no serious um, experience at all in slot. Right. Um, but when I drop into slot school, I can play any of the games in the advanced class. I can't do any of the beginner stuff. Mm. It's interesting. If, if, if they tell me to flow with them their way, I can blend into that. But when it's no, for this, you need to move your left hand like this, your right hand like this. And the fact that you're telling me means that you know what I'm about to do next. So no, and you said, no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I, I, I am almost allergic to predictable movement. It's, it's, so Rory's, Rory's a treat to train. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. His experimental laboratory. Yes. Um, but he's willing to learn. He does I, want me to challenge him to pummel every morning yeah. for the next little bit. Yeah. He wants to get it down so he can show because he does see the value for the students of learning how to do stuff through movement. Yeah. So it's good. Well, it's, I always do stuff through movement. Yeah. It just, yeah, not predictable movement. Predictable movement is, yeah. Mm. Um, this is something that's like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, all right, guys. I, I think that's uh, that's that's a good high point to to finish us off on. I wish you guys all the best, Rory uh, and Randy. Thank you very much, Randy. Do you want to plug the upcoming seminars? Let's give, let's give our your upcoming host a good shout out and where they can go yes. for tickets and all that kind of stuff. Now Rory's mirroring me. So we're doing <laughs> that was a predictable <laughs> movement. Yeah. So we're going to do Shooters Paradise in Ethel, Louisiana, is our next stop. So next weekend being the 20 oh, what's the date today i've been on the road too long seven days after whatever day we're on now yeah okay, but this so is coming out later. today is the 19th of september where you are okay 26 then so 26 no that'd be the end so 24 25, yeah. 26. 24 25 26 we are in shooters paradise follow them at shooters paradise inc or on facebook uh if you have any information in the louisiana area we'd love to have you uh and you're not you know dealing with the hurricane um, then from there, we are going to Team Torque MMA within Wilmington, Ohio. Uh, follow uh, Team Torque. Also, uh, instructor Ben say on TikTok. If you're a TikTok person and you're a martial arts, you probably already know him. Almost a million followers. Uh, I really want Joe. I really want you to get him on the show. He's a great. He's a great guy. He's a and, good kid. And honestly, like he has a million followers. It's a good idea. Um, so he's almost as famous from- as me. Yeah, almost. He's, almost. He'll, he'll get there one day. All right. Then uh, from there, we're going to Metro West Jiu-Jitsu in Natick, Massachusetts. Um, follow them on Instagram and Facebook. If you're in the area, we'd love to see you. Uh, then we're going to Gentry Martial Arts in Mansville, Indiana. Um, and so the way it's working is everyone I'm saying is the next weekend after the next weekend after the next weekend. Um, if you want more specific, specific information, follow myself at Randy King Live. Um, or go on Facebook and join the Rand Rory Seminar Tour Facebook group where we're hooking people up. So from Gentry Martial Arts, we're, in, we're at Violence Dynamics uh, Prime, October 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th. Um, that's always a huge event. That's not just myself and Rory. That's uh, Tamir McCracken and Casey Keckheis will be there as well. No Terry this year. Then we are in Fridley, Minnesota with Robert Frankovich and White Tiger Martial Arts. Then after that, ideally, we might do a Nebraska thing. We'll see. And then the last but not least stop is uh, they haven't really given me a school name, but it's Andy Gobranson and Opal Herbert are hosting us in Moscow, Idaho for the final seminar on the tour. And that is the weekend of Halloween here. So that's October 29th, 30th, 31st. Awesome. And look, from my perspective, guys, if you're listening to this, uh, go out and support your local martial arts schools that are trying to do yeah. stuff. They're trying to get instructors in. We've all been locked down. We've all had, we've all had uh, limitations on accessing information. It's, I mean, uh, as much as it's great to listen to podcasts and do webinars and that kind of stuff, there's nothing, nothing beats skin on skin contact with someone who knows what they're doing and getting punched in the mouth. So uh, make, make sure that make sure you check it out, right? Let's support these guys. Let's make this financially viable for them. Uh, not to say for Randy and Rory's perspective, but for the school owners. So they keep doing exactly. this stuff, right? Support your yeah. local communities. If you're, if you're within a couple of hours drive of one of those locations, get off your butt, yeah. get in the car, go, go attend those seminars and, uh, and make the most of it. Cause that's at the end of the day, like if, if we don't support them, they're not going to continue happening. So, so let's, uh, right. let's bring some friends. If we can't, if we can't sell out a Rory Miller seminar, people are in trouble. Right. So yeah. let's, uh, let's figure this out. Yeah. Awesome. We want our hosts to do good. Yeah. So. Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you very much. All the best thank for you. the future. And, uh, this episode will be out in the next couple of days to promote the upcoming one. So, uh, all good. Sounds great. Cool. Yes.
Uh, thanks very much for listening or watching if you're on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Just a reminder, we'll be back October 11 with Spencer Corson and uh, the New Look MVP. It is coming up very, very soon. Until then, make sure you follow us on Facebook. We're at Managing Violence on Instagram at Managing Violence. We are on YouTube, Managing Violence podcast. We are pretty much everywhere else you could possibly look for us as Managing Violence. So keep in the loop. Give us a like, give us a follow, hit subscribe, whatever you need to do. Show the show, the show some love. Uh, I look forward to being back on a regular basis from October 11, starting with Spencer Corson. Until then, I'll talk to you next time.